uh, sometimes that is better. When I was wrong, sometimes dead is better. Hello and welcome to YCFT. We've reached our yearly Stephen King project. Yay! <laughs> As we started our very first year, we did It. Yes. Last year we did Salem's Lot. Yes. Which, weirdly, Salem's Lot 2004 was, is still our most successful video by yes. a long, oh, yeah. long milestone, which is cra insane for us. Yeah. So this, you wanted to do The Shining. Yes. <laughs> I, I lost. <laughs> I convinced you otherwise. We're doing The Shining next year. That's the reveal. Yes. We are talking about Pet Cemetery. So <laughs> <laughs> that Ramon song just oh, popped oh into your God. head. Obviously written by Stephen King. Really Stephen, Stephen, Stephen King Project. Yeah. Like with uh, Sales Lot, I have read the book. Or I listened to an audio book. It was narrated by the guy who played Dexter. Mm. I have to keep saying breaks because it's a very dark book. You've not read this one. I have not. I, I don't know if I ever will, <laughs> to be honest. I'll get into the book in a moment. So a brief synopsis. On, there's no point going into great detail on the part of these films because the, the story is so famous. Yeah. Both versions of the film follow well, a similar story to the book where Lewis Creed, the doctor, mm -hmm. moves his family to Ludlow, Maine, which is, you know, love Stephen King, very famous. He's from Maine, everything. Yes. He does is set there. Yes, yes, yes. He lives across the road from Judge Crandall, and between their houses is a very busy road where semi trucks drive at very, very fast speeds. Yeah. And because of that, a lot of pets are killed, and there is a pet cemetery. Yeah. This leads to the death of the family cat church, and through a few things going on, Judd introduces Lewis to the ancient burial ground, the Micmac burial ground, mm. beyond the pet cemetery, and where the ground is sour. 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 The accent. Hey, yeah. Hey, yeah. Anything that is buried in that ground will come back, but not as they were. Yeah, different. Both stories kind of go into the certain forces lead to the death of a child mm. and that child being buried. Mm -hmm. That is... That was Pet Cemetery. Obviously, it is very famously misspelled because it's meant to be something that children have made, yes. the community has made. Yes. And I think it's, it's now so... Well known that that actually isn't classed as an incorrect spelling. Like if you type it in like Word or something like that. I did no... not know that. Yeah. Wow. And my phone now autocorrects the cemetery with an S uh, from no. research for this. <laughs> I've typed it in so many times. So the book came out in 1983, but I think he'd written yeah. it a couple of years prior. Recently, there was like a little uh, introduction before the novel that said that he wrote it, but it's one of he's often said that it's one of the few of his actual novels that actually scares him. Mm. And he kind of thought he'd went too far mm -hmm. with it, and he shelved it. But it was based off his daughter's cat was killed by a truck outside of his house. Yes. And the theme in both films, it is dealing with death, or how do you talk about death? I know you've got a quote from... Mm. The director of the original one about this do you want to yeah so i was, was watching the uh, the dvd commentary and the the first movie the 1989 one is directed by mary lambert and she was saying how she she personally thinks that the reason that the the story of pet cemetery whether it's the book or whether it's the films the reason that it's so enduring is yes because of how it deals with death but not from the angle of experiencing death and the trauma of it necessarily, but she thinks what is a lot more relatable to people is the theme of talking to your loved ones about death or explaining the concept of death to your loved ones. And in, in Pet Cemetery, a huge theme is, you know, the little girl Ellie, her cat, is church, is, is killed. And so death that is her first introduction and there's a you know scene where the dad has to sit down with her and explain it to her her mum has a complete aversion to the concept of it and so mary lambert is just she was basically saying which i thought was just interesting that she she thinks that that notion of talking about it is actually what makes the story much more relatable to people which i just found very very interesting yeah very interesting there's so many different versions of the experience of dealing with death within this. Yeah. So that both start with like Lewis dealing with the death of a stranger, of, the, of a student on his very first day in the job, the death of a family pet and trying to explain that to your child. To your child. Your or rather, child. he tries to avoid having to explain. Like yeah. how many stories do you know about, about you see online where like 
the goldfish has died, so they just replace it. So they just flush it down the loo. Yeah. With that. Yeah. See, Rachel is in both incarnations. Her sister died because of uh, obviously a, med- a medical con- a medical condition. Then we have like the death of a child, the death of a friend, the death of a spouse. There are so many different versions yeah. of loved ones di- and people dying the, in this. The story forces you to confront. Yeah. There will be yeah. something that everyone in their lives will relate to. Yeah. One of these situations. Totally. Yeah. That's how I think makes this one particularly dark, but also like weirdly grounded for a Stephen King novel. Definitely. Novel. Yeah. And he, he did think he went a bit too far with this one. He <laughs> shelved it. Too far. For a couple of, for a couple of years. I think he wrote it in... I, I'm not going to say when he wrote I, I don't know off the top of my head when he wrote I just know it was a couple of years. But he wanted to get out of his publishing contract. Yeah. And he had one book remaining and his wife read it and said he should give them this one. Mm. So I think he sent off to the editor, cleaned it up a little bit. And it was a massive hit. Yeah. But he literally came because he wanted out of his contract. Yeah. I, th- I think I'm right in saying it was 79 yeah. when he started writing it. But also, you know, well done, Tabitha, because that's... that's she's do- She did that a few times with his book. She, she read it with, uh, Cat- with uh, it Carrie. Sarah Lott as well, wasn't it? And, and the very first one as well. She was like, you've got to publish this. <laughs> this yeah. It's pretty good, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. Tabitha every, King. Every good man is a good woman telling him the right thing to do. <laughs> so... So yeah, that's kind of like the origins of the book. And both films kind of have weird origins mm. as well. Stephen King actually wrote the screenplay for the 89 film that Mary Lambert did. directed. And originally, yes. George A. Romero was going to direct it. He was involved, then yes. He... Well, the film rights were sold to Romero back yeah. in 84. Yes, but he ended up busy working on something else. Yes. Said, I can't remember what what the film was. And Mary Lambert did have to meet with Stephen King and she was a massive fan. She mm-hmm. like, essentially convinced them that she was right for the project. He was very impressed by her. Yeah. And he actually had final choice over um, director yeah. as well. And he said, oh, I like, I like Mary. But she she gets it. Interestingly, he wrote this screenplay. Like, scre- he has great novels. His screenplays aren't always great. And I think there's a couple of issues. It's a different this skill, one. you know, it is a different, medium. different skill. But what led to this one was the 1988 writer's strike. They had the script, but they didn't want to make the film because there'd already been a slew of Stephen King adaptations. and Didn't do particularly well. Yeah, they thought they'd been, it was oversaturated. Yes. Then the writer's strike happened, but he had the screenplay written by Stephen King, ready to go. Yeah. So that's it. That's how the film, they, st- yeah. they started making it in, eight, in, in 88 to come out in 89. Yeah. It was um, development executive Lindsay, Lindsay Doran, um, they, she loved the, the finished script, but again, was kind of curtailed from pursuing it because, um, again, you know, Stephen King was not necessarily considered a hot property in the early mid 80s. And so when the strike happened, it was Lindsay that was like, I want to push for this. <laughs> so well done. Well done to yeah, Lindsay. Yeah, we've got this finished product. Let's just do it. Yeah, yeah. And the film did pretty well. Did, financially. Financially did pretty well. Critically did not do that well. And I think even today sometimes isn't regarded... Yeah. This has just, but this has a massive following and it is very beloved. It's a good film. I'm, I'm not even, I'm not going to even throw the notion that that the 2019 one is better. No. There are certain things in that that I like, mm-hmm. but this is a really good Stephen King adaptation. It is. Yeah. And I think because he worked so closely on the production, there's so many photos of him like on set. It's very special to him. Yeah. Where and he has did. a little cameo in it, famously. He does. Well. He does have a, as a cameo in it. So 2019 also had a bit of a rocky production because they've been trying to get something off the ground for 10 years, yes. a, re- a remake of it. Which, yes. when you think, so this came out in 2019, so 2009, yep, remakes were peak. Like, oh, yeah. That would have been the Friday 13th book. <coughs> also, Friday the 13th plays an interesting part in this story because of rights. Mm. So, if anyone hasn't seen our Friday the 13th videos or knows the situation, the Friday the 13th remake led to the original writer, his lawyer, found a clause within copyright where after certain amount of time has passed, they can get claim the rights back to their work if they feel like it's not been mm. used properly. And that is what led to like, was not having a Friday the 13th. It's, it's complicated. It's messy. Stephen King took advantage of this and started to claim back all of his yeah. rights that he'd sold off very early on in his career. You notice we don't get as many Stephen King adaptations at the moment. No. Nope. Because he has the rights to them and he can shop them around to whoever he wants. Yeah. So this film had to go into, it basically pushes, all right, we have to go into production now because we're going to lose the rights soon. Mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure that's why the film after this, the prequel, they could still make sequels and prequels to a film they've made, but they can't make a straight up number adaptation yeah. of it. So they were kind of like, all right, we need to get the ball rolling get on this. Who, I, can't, I always forget the directors of this one. Um, there are two, two, two guys. Kevin 
Kolsch. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, I'm sorry. And Dennis Widmeyer. And it was written by a guy called Jeff Buhler. And it does have to be said that Kolsch and Widmeyer are um, major fanboys of, yeah. of Stephen King. Uh, this was also really financially successful. Yes, it was. Budget, 21 million. Box office, 113.1 million. Ooh. This did well. Critically, also did not do very well. No. I uh, also didn't go and see this when it first came out. I, I can't remember why. But... I did not like this when I first watched it. I watched it about a year after it came out. Uh, we're not going to the twist just just oh, yet. No, no. Admittedly, so I was a bit apprehensive about re-watching it. But I actually did appreciate it a lot more upon rewatch. And I've, I've talked to a couple of people about it, and they all say upon rewatch, it's actually a lot better than than the thought upon first viewing. But I would say there's the, the Blu-ray has a couple of deleted scenes and an alternate ending, which we'll go into, which if you could watch a full, an alternate cut with all of them included, would be a, a vastly it's superior film. <laughs> oh my God, it, it annoyed me that certain things were taken out of this film. Well, I, so when we watched 2019 recently, that was my very first time watching it. And I, I'm going to be honest, I really liked it. I couldn't understand why it wasn't considered a good film or like why it's kind of been forgotten about. Because my, my first impression was, you know what, this is, this is pretty decent. I mean, you know, we'll dissect it as we go. Some things it could have done better. Um, it's not a perfect movie by any means, but I think as an adaptation, it's it's pretty solid. Yeah. One thing I like about both films is they're both set mostly on a location. Like the eighty nine is filmed in Maine. It is. That was a prerequisite from King. I'm pretty yeah, sure. And yeah, and I think it helps. And they got the accents of oh, the yeah. accents throughout that film are, are fantastic. But they got the house. Well, they couldn't get Judd's house exactly how they wanted. So it was an old barn, and they built a facade around it to look like his yeah. house. Yeah. But so you had this location with the road going through them and yeah. it looked great. They, I don't think they filmed, they didn't film the second one in Maine, but it is filmed on location with two houses that, w that were exactly where they needed perfect. to be. Yeah. The only set they had was the burial ground, which mm. I'm going to say the burial ground in 89 looks so much better than the burial yes. ground in 2019. Yes. Burial ground scenes are just, they look like a studio set. Yeah. Whereas it was a real set in 89. Yeah. Uh, one thing I actually, I, I don't know if anyone else will give 2019 credit for this, but hedges. <laughs> so, obviously it's a real set, two real, like two houses. Part of what makes 89 so good is you can always, you can see the trucks coming. Yeah. It's a big, it's a big open field. Uh -huh. There's a certain amount of fear. The fact that there's hedges around the house, around the Creed house, you know the trucks are going to be coming, but you can't. See, Can't them. see them, and it leaves There's a blind spot there in modern day. Where well, I feel like, especially if it was down today, you are very vigilant on your kids. Like there's less like any kids just yeah, sure. be free because it's it's a more dangerous <laughs> world. Yeah, I always think like I feel like you should be able to in eight nine. I always think every time I watch it, you'd be able to see and hear the truck beforehand. Yeah, even though, no matter how fast it's going. You can't because of the head the way the hedges are out. You cannot see when that truck is coming until it's too late. It's a nice and that touch. is a added tension yes. that I only appreciated on this second watch. And so, yeah, I, I compliment that house's hedges for well, helping raise tension. I'm glad we got that out there. I'm, I'm glad I'm glad I got to give the landscaping so the, pro, the pros that it needed. Well, that's Pet cemetery, guys. <laughs> yeah, but it's a for the, yeah. Uh, Good hedges. <laughs> so the cast, should we talk about the casting? Let, okay, yeah. For, do you want to start with 89? Yeah. Okay. Part of Lewis Creed, uh, the do Doctor... We've got a guy called Dale Midkiff, who I don't think I've seen. He's got one of those faces that seems like I should... I feel like I have seen you in stuff, but I don't... I can't place yeah. him in anything else. Very good looking man. Very good looking man. I'm going to say... Acting is very questionable. He's got moments of... that are great. But ultimately, I do think he looks bored through most of the film. Like, his grieving scenes are very much just... You look, wouldn't think. No. <laughs> like, he's a very... No offence. I feel Very like he was wooden. trying to just internalise everything, but... Yeah, but we needed a little bit of emotion. Yeah. We needed a little bit of something. It's just a very wooden performance all round. Like, I don't... When there were moments where he should be scared or sad, I'm not... I, I don't know. Like you you just... You wouldn't think it, basically. So, yeah. we, anyway, we've got Dale as, as Lewis Creed. In the part of Rachel, his wife, we've got Denise Crosby. Um, We have Fred Gwynn 
as Judd. Herman Munster Herman himself. Herman Munster. And that was a, a casting that a lot of people questioned because I think he often struggled in his career because of the monster, the monsters. Yes. But um, Mary Lambert's first choice. Yeah. First and only choice. He and she got him. Is perfect. And I the thing love it when that without happens. him, this film wouldn't be nearly as good. And it's, he goes all in an accent. We obviously we have the famous like <laughs> sometimes. Dead is, is better. Well, sometimes that is better. <laughs> the road, Lewis. Lewis, the Lewis, road. The road. <laughs> it's, he goes, and I, I love it. It's absolutely wonderful. I, it's iconic. I, I, it is I, absolutely iconic. It is. And something we will talk about, I have to say, Judd going as, Fred Gwynn going as hard as he did on that main accent is largely responsible for how I've come to feel subsequently about other Pet Cemetery adaptations. <laughs> because I miss, when that main accent is not there, I miss it. Anyway, we'll come, to, we'll come back to that. Ben doesn't always know why he does things, Lewis. I think I did it because your daughter ain't ready for her favorite pet to die. Maybe with more time, she'll learn what death really is. So yeah, Fred Gwynn, legend. I love casting stories like that too. Um, in the role of Victor Pascal or pa Pasco, I don't know. I feel like America maybe pronounced the surname differently. Uh, we've got a guy called Brad Green Greenquist. He is. I really like him. So he's the. I like him as well. Oh, he's mostly he dies very beginning. Probably he's a ghost. He's a very playful ghost he is. in this one. And yeah, I, I I like that. I always have. I'm just going to jump in and say he is so much better in '89 than he is. He's not basically not really a character in 2019, whereas he's much more involved in the, the yeah. plot yeah. of '89. I really I really like the the make in both films the yeah. makeup of his wound spot. On. Yeah, Mary Lambert also in the commentary said that she likens his character to a, an angel, a good angel. Yeah, whereas Judd to... is a ba actually a bad angel. Yeah, which is inter very interesting. Um, in the part of Ellie, we actually have twins. We've got Blaze and Bo Birdle. Um, although for some reason it was Blaze that got the credit. I think, but Bo it does appear. In... I think it's he was in more. She's yeah. in the film more prominently. Yeah, Bla Blaze and Bo. Um, in the role of Gage. We have Miko Hughes, the little baby-faced angelic Miko Hughes. And in the role of Zelda, we've got Andrew Hubertsek. That was his theatrical debut as well. So, yeah, so they want, in order to make things look a little bit off, Yeah. Rachel's sister was played by was played by a man, in, played heavy, by man. in heavy prospects. Yeah. We will get to Zelda later. Yes, don't worry. We'll, we'll, we'll dissect. Yeah. On Miko as Gage, they actually wanted twins. Yeah, but they couldn't. Usually but the apparently, way. he was he was just perfect That's for the fair. role. No fair. <laughs> Obviously, he has the very difficult task as a young as a child actor of being scary. <laughs> being scary, yes. And the, the film gets around that in multiple ways, which we will also get into. Yes. And so we also have a cat. We have several cat I've actors got, yeah, in this one. Got a lot of lot, of, lot cats. of cats. Don't yeah. have the names of the cats. Yeah, several of the cats. Some that were trained to jump. Some that were trained to hiss. And some that were trained to be cuddly. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. That's a theme. And to get the glowing eyes, they literally just, because cats are, you know, anyone's driving on the road, you know, the little reflective things, they're called cat's eyes for a reason. That's cat's how cat's eyes react. So they had a little torch above the camera lens. Yeah. Shining into the cat's eyes and they would, so they would glow. And you can sometimes see when the cat turns its head away, the eyes go back to normal. Yeah. So a, a very, very cool effect. Yeah. It's 2019. Oh, 2019. Yes. Cast. We have. Cast. The, 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 cast, the cast. The cast. My past. <laughs> Um, we've got in Lu as Lewis. We've got Jason Clark, who is a phenomenal actor. He is uh, straight up. He is better in this. Than... Oh my god! Yeah, he's better Lewis for he's sure. A better Lewis. But I also just like Jason Clark in general. Like he's really good. Most recently, I think he was in Oppenheimer. He plays the the interrogator guy. And hmm. um, he's great in that. He's such a scene stealer. Um, but you know, so much more emotive. <laughs> and also, he's Australian, and Aussies are just like generally really good actors. Yeah. Um. Rachel is played by Amy Seamitz. Seamitz? Don't know how you pronounce her name. She's an interesting one because she also she comes from a filmmaking background, so she is an actress, but she's also a director. She's also a producer. Mm -hmm. And I remember when we were watching the making of it, and the the directors were saying like she was really great to have on set because she was considering things from like all sorts yeah. of different angles, which was actually very helpful. I think she was also really good, and but unfortunately, I think it's a lot of her scenes that were cut. Yeah, unfortunately, she's so. still good. She's still really good, but when you look in the deleted scenes, like oh. Well, Rachel is kind of just an interesting one in general because, like her her main thing, aside from grieving for the child, the loss of a child, 
it's processing the trauma of yeah. what happened with her sister. And I think that Denise Crosby and Amy in 2019, like they, they, they do it differently. They do it in different ways. So that'll be an interesting thing to compare. Um, Jude in this one is played by John Lithgow. Who was actually friends with Fred Quinn, wasn't he? Yes. John Lithgow, yeah. he's one of those actors. You cast him, you know he's going to be good. Yeah. Lord and Farquhar. I think he has... <laughs> Oh yeah, Shrek. I think he has the hardest job in this film following on from Fred. Yeah. And do you bet he does do the accent? He does do the accent. He does do the accent. Yeah. It's not as deep. No, but it's there. But he's he's good. That's that's it. He's just good. Once you feel the power of that place, you make up the sweetest smelling reasons to go back. But I was wrong. Sometimes dead is better. Yes, he is. It's John Lithgow. It's a solid casting yeah. choice. He's always a solid casting choice. And Ellie is played by Jette Lawrence. She is very good. She's excellent. She's excellent in this film. And they also had a bunch of... They actually changed the breed of cat, didn't they? Yeah, so in the book and in the 89 film, the cat is a British short hair. Um, and yeah, called Church. In 2019 one, it's like a, they changed it to a fluffy, scraggy looking tabby cat. Which, with a makeup... I can understand. It looks more disheveled. And they also, the cats were tra- like royalty. And I think all the cats that they used actually got adopted afterwards. In fact, I think one of the animal had wranglers actually adopted like the main cat well, who passed away not too recently. <coughs> oh yeah. Was it Leo? His name? Yeah. There were five cats in 2019. One was fired because he got too scared. <laughs> Fine. But he got rehomed. <laughs> but they were all spoiled. And it was interesting too in the 2019, the making of it. Apparently cats are quite hard to train, which surprised me. I've never grown up with cats. So I don't know, but they, yeah, they're quite hard to train. And the way that you do it is you emotionally bond with them mm. first. So the trainers had ve- like really like personal relationships with these cats, which I loved. Um, so yeah, lots of cats again. Yeah, cat acting in both of them is really good. But I, I particularly like what they did in Twenty Nineteen. Just the makeup. Yeah. On the cats, which apparently like the cats were all fine with. It was all like it was none of the cats <laughs> were harmed in the makings of either of these films. Yeah. And by the cats had a had a great time. Apparently they did. Yeah, they were treated even uh, fine. Miko, but when he was playing Gage, he uh, he had a little like nursery. Yeah. In, be- in between takes that yeah. he'd go to. All right, should we go into my next? I've actually got like more. I'm more organized. We needed to structure points. this one. We need the structure. It's a, it's this a one. big one. Yeah. Because they all got through the cast. Actually, do we have who played Gage in the 2019 one? I didn't write it down because he's not really not really a character, and that yeah. kind of goes into the, my next point, which is. The death of the child. Yes. Famously, every year I always see the meme of of Gage stood in front of the truck and it says Gage against the machine. Fucking hell. I know. <laughs> I know. He so loses. yeah, famously Gage is knocked down by a truck I and know. is the one that is buried. Go truck. Is buried in the pet cemetery. It's yeah. It is spoilers. It is not the way in 2019. Mm. I had to go back and watch the trailer to make sure it wasn't in it. Is this hints? But. I, I don't think that was revealed before people went to see the film. And Stephen King did approve of the change. It is Ellie that is hit by the truck. Yes. I did know this going into watching it somehow. I don't, I don't know how I found out. I think I just told you yeah, when we were I, talking about these. Yeah. I think I assumed it was probably it was live knowledge at the time. Well, to be fair, like I... So, I, yeah. Okay. If I watched it for the first time. I knew going in it was it was going to be Ellie and not Gage. Didn't deter from the... From the horror of the moment. It's like, yeah. at the end of the day, a child is still splattered by a truck. Yeah. You know? It's the 89 one, again, because it's such a wide open, you just see the truck coming. It's never easy to watch. And that's what's good about this scene. It should never be easy. It should never get easier with time. No, it's it's the little bloody shoe that you oh, see. Oh, 89 it's, is... Yeah. yeah. It, it's the... Followed by the funeral and us, Lewis coming to blows with <sighs> Rachel's father. I... I have to say, I know, I know. Sorry, we're talking about the death scene, but the funeral scene I find excruciatingly painful to yeah. watch. I actually find that in a way harder than the death yeah. itself because it's just well, death is so quick, isn't it? The yeah. funeral's like I imagine like the first one that actually it could actually like hit what has yeah. happened, and it's like you're just stuck in this horrible, really awkward, grief stricken situation, and it's oh my god, it's like the worst possible thing to the end it gets so bad that the coffin is knocked over and you can see a glimpse of gauge in the coffin mm. and oh yeah i don't know it's just that is that for me is like the worst scene in the, in the film yeah there's one thing that ellie says it it's not in the 891 
but Ellie says it at the beginning of twenty of twenty nineteen. It's from the novel. Uh, like the thing that Gage would, would say, Lewis would often repeat it to itself in his head. Oz the great and powerful. Mm. It's like him just miss saying it because he's young. I appreciated actually having it in the twenty nineteen one, but again, there's there's lots from the book that just couldn't be yeah included. Uh, so death of the child in twenty. It's actually very well done, especially if you don't know what's coming. They, it's a birthday party. It's Ellie's birthday party. Yeah. And you see Gage starting to head out on the street. And this is after Lewis has got rid of the cat. The cat has come back. It's different. Yeah. So he kind of just like takes it away. Yeah. And the cat almost lures Ellie onto the street as well. Mm. So you, you think it's Gage right up until it isn't. Yeah. And that's it. You see the truck like crash and everything. And it's it's still hard to watch. I will say 99. I think Lewis's scream in 99 sounds way more pained. Oh, like, no. Yeah. Yeah. It's it, it it's horrible. Yeah. It's still a really good scene in 2019. And that, you know, so Stephen King did approve of the, switch. the swap. And the main, one thing they didn't want to do, and when we get to Zelda, it's kind of a similar thing. They didn't just want to do what had been done before. Mm. But also by switching it to Ellie, you can have a slightly older actor. Mm. And that was her name again. Jeté. Jeté. She was very, very good. Being able to go from like, not like alive Ellie to evil dead mm-hmm. Ellie. Mm-hmm. She is she can do so much more than Miko could as Gage. Of course, yeah. And it, I, that is the the main strength of this film is having Ellie be the child that dies. Totally, and she could be a bit more yeah, a bit more manipulative with Lewis. So yeah, to add on to that, um, the Ellie collision in twenty nineteen. One thing I love, really appreciated in twenty nineteen was sound design hmm. i'll highlight a few other examples as we go but there's a lack of sound design really in this scene because it's actually silent when the truck yeah hits her everything just goes completely quiet you know like as you do when you're in shock I, that was a nice little touch i i did like that and yeah you're right wait having ellie be the one that is killed when she comes back you have a lot more opportunity to have a bit of fun, I guess, with with this character, you know, who's slightly older, and when she's back and she's processing being dead, like there's a there's an awareness. Yeah. The makeup on her is dead. very good as well. They give her like a an eye that's like a bit slanted. Oh, it's like a little bit slanted, a bit sunken. And there's a great, well, great horrible scene where he's bathing her, like the first time she comes back. He's bathing his little girl, you know, and he's he's trying to brush her hair and the hair. Smell of the dirt you buried in him. Yeah, a smell of the dirt. And she's, he's brushing his, his daughter's hair in the bath and he's just, you know, like, just broken. <laughs> yeah. And he gets tangled and caught in her hair and then he kind of looks to see what it is and the staples in oh, the back God, of her head, yeah. which is really, ni- makeup-wise, really nicely done, but horrible. And she's, she looks around to her dad and she's like, what is it? And he thinks he says like, oh, it's just a tangle, sweetheart. It's fine. Yeah. It's fine. <clears throat> like next day, the fact that she dresses up in like one of her dresses and just dances around, just breaking things, just like, tormenting him in one of the simplest ways possible by like just being a bit off off and it's you can see the the pain yeah because she likes ballet and you know she dresses up as a ballerina when she's back and obviously you know it's she was very a very graceful dancer in life and very balletic and then when she starts dancing dead she gets very erratic and the joints are a little bit yeah. off and she just can't quite she can't quite hack it yeah. anymore. Well, in, in 89, Lewis never sees Gage when it comes back until he starts killing people. Yes. And I think that's an advantage 2019 has having those moments before the carnage. Yeah. It also just it allows more moments, like you were saying, of her to taunt her parents in a way that baby Gage just can't do. Because there's a line as well where she gets like in full... Um, I don't know what zombie is. Like, I don't know how to work. Like, but when she's like fully evil... Um, she says to her dad, you let me die. Oh no, she says to her mom. Sorry, she's, this is to her mom. You let me die just like you let your sister die. Gage could never say that. No. Gage doesn't have those words in his vocabulary. No. It's, I do like evil Gage. No fair. No and it's just, fair. We'll, we'll talk about them again. We'll talk about the finale in its own little sure. bit. But the, the two, the kids' deaths and them coming back, I really like. And those are the yes. build up, obviously. Done well in both. Yeah. The same like the burial of the cats i i do think it's done better in 1889 mm-hmm. 
there's so much from the book that can't be included here, which yeah, is like sure. mainly the absence of Norma, Judd's wife. In the yeah. book, she's very she's very ill, and Lewis actually helps her when she has a, a heart attack. Mm. And that is part of the reason why Judd shows him the pet cemetery after church dies. Mm. It's because he saved his wife. Mm. Norma does ultimately end up dying in the in the film. That leads to the question of would you ever bury a person? Yeah. Out there. Yeah. Uh so we kind of miss a lot of that. But yeah. I do think 89 shows the process of going to the burial ground. The burial ground itself. It's I like, love that. It's like the, the unspoken... Well, this, you never really learn the rules. But is that one of you bury your own? You bury your own. You bury your own. I'd help you, but you got to do it yourself. Each buries his own. Also, in, in 1989... So, yeah, we, we're missing Norma in both adaptations. In 89... Um, a character called Missy Dandridge kind of replaces Norma. Um, Missy is Missy, from what I believe, she is a character from the book, but mm. she's not a main character, and she's kind of reworked into the screenplay. Bear in mind, eighty nine was written by King as well. Like he so knew he had to simplify the story a little bit. Yeah, so. definitely. I think he did a decent job as well. Um, but yeah, Missy kind of becomes the um, the Creed's housekeeper, and she's. Very much implied that she's got stomach cancer and she she's crippled by the pain and she kills herself. She hangs herself in a basement, like halfway through the halfway through the film. And I think, if I remember right, that's what kicks off discussions about death. Yeah, that's it. In the book, it's obviously like he avoids it with church by bringing church back. But yeah, even Ellie can tell that the cat's not doesn't want. Yeah, he's smelly. Yeah, doesn't want him in the room anymore. He yeah. smells smells a bit. You need a but Nor- Norma dying in the book is when they do just have to talk to Ellie about death. It's mostly Rachel that doesn't want to. Lewis thinks that it's important it's for her to understand it, but yeah. because of Rachel's relationship with Zelda when she, she was younger, she it. can't. She can't process it. And I like those two, those two uh, points of view. But we're gonna. I think something that we agreed with, um, we'll say several times. Is Pet Cemetery would work better as a TV series. Yes, a hundred or a mini series. Yeah, because then you could have whole episode dedicated to like even just burying the cat burying the child talking about that just have norma as a character i can understand for film annotations that you've got you've got to cut things out i totally understand that but yeah it's like stephen king stephen king's books more often than not there are scenes that involve flashbacks you know, things involving current events that relate to events of the past. You know, like, how have people dealt with this before? And it's the same in Pet Cemetery. Judd, I'm assuming it's Judd who recounts to Lewis other things that have happened to do with the Pet Cemetery. And obviously in 89, it's just... We do get something of a flashback with one particular character, um, but it's very quick and it's, you know, got to move on to the next scene. 2019... It does the classic thing of the character just oh. researching it online and Googling it and we get a few articles. It's like, it's such, like, I get it for time, but it's just like such a cliche yeah. way of hearing about it. And we we were saying as we were watching 2019, like, how amazing it would be if there were, this was a mini series and we just had an episode that was maybe just Judd and Lewis sitting on the porch with a beer and Judd tells him the stories and we flash back. Yeah. There's a whole episode there just dedicated to Tommy Bateman and the bull. Timmy. T- sorry, Timmy. Timmy and the bull. Like, we get that. We'd have a whole episode just dedicated yeah, to that. Judd's dog. So we see his Judd dog. That's what we see as well. Spot. Spot. They changed the name of the dog. I can't remember what they changed it to. But I think it, in the actual Pet Cemetery, both Pet Cemeteries look really good. But there's... Yeah, you have... You see spots. You see there is one for... Stephen King's daughter's cat. Smucky. Smucky, yeah. Uh, I think a couple of the crew put like their own yeah. on there to build to build it out. I get set like amazing set work on this one. You stick to the ground, you buried him in. John! You say he smells of the dirt, you buried him in. Yeah, and there's a prize the prized bull of someone that lives in Ludlow. Yeah, the bull's always and the bull like <laughs> would just charge at things, it would just charge at a tree, breaking its horns. And then it's famously the World War Two. Uh, soldier Timmy Bateman mm. who came back in a box but then people started to see him yeah, he's around. very much portrayed in that film that flashback is like a zombie like a night living dead zombie but in the book it's not it's not like that it's like he's very much he does cause trouble but that's what these things do it, no, they know things they shouldn't but the fact that he's also alive is what is scary that's what leads to Judd and a couple of others like confronting them in the house burning down 
they change the time because obviously we're a few years in the future. It's he's a Vietnam. But he died. Nineteen, yeah. Yeah, but again, I, I don't like it when it's just told or he researches it. Yeah, that I liked having the brief flashback. I just wanted a little bit more. So I guess that kind of goes into one of my points, but the Wendigo. Yes. Which is actively mentioned in 2019, which I liked, but it's a big part of the book that's also kind of not. Mm. It's the brief references to it in 89 are when we hear like trees crashing when they're heading to the burial ground. So it's like, and it's like a, a roar. And that is that is all we have of it. The Wendigo. It was a myth passed down from the local tribes up this way. But to them, it wasn't just some campfire story. They believed it. And it's shown off in very different ways, but it has an area of effect in the end. It's what influences a lot of people to do things, and it soured the ground, and that's why the tribe left. Mm. It's what brings things back. It Even in the book, they say that the driver that hit Gage felt compelled, or drivers in general feel compelled to go faster during Ludlow during, while going through there, and mm. they don't know why. That driver in particular felt the need to go even faster. Mm. Judd... Yes, he shows in the pet cemetery for to save Ellie the the fear of uh, losing church, losing church. But also, he feels compelled to. And there's a bit, a great bit for Green. He's like, I may, I may be, the, I may be the one that killed your daughter. Mm. It has an effect on people, mm. Mm. and it's kind of absent from both of these, from both of these films. I obviously it's mentioned in 2019. We see it in a book. He opens up books. Ah, the Wendigo. <laughs> the Wendigo. The Wendigo, and. Again, if we had a TV series, we could dedicate more time to it. Yes. And it's often personified by... You never really get a good description of it, other than it's like glowing eyes that just always seem to be watching in, in from the the trail from the pet cemetery to the burial ground. Yeah. So I want to, I would love a bit more yeah. of that. And in, in a later, the next video we're going to do is Pet Cemetery 2, and then we're going to do Bloodlines. I've got a lot to say about the Wendigo in Bloodlines, but we will... Get we'll get there, we'll get there. But something again, with the time you have with a film, unless you literally make the men to go the big bad, yeah. yeah, it kind of makes sense to trim it down. But it does, it yeah, absolutely. affects the characters, it plays on yeah. their grief. I think it's it, it, 89, it's, it's sort of mentioned like you can hear a howl mm. or a laugh or something in the woods when Judd's taking Lewis up over the, um, what do they call it? Like the, the barrier between the cemetery and the, oh. it's, it's called something, I can't remember exactly what. And Lewis was like, what was that? And then Judd's like, he looks a bit nervous and then he, he kind of like passes it off yeah. as something. But I think Mary Lambert said like, oh, that was meant to be the Wendigo. Yeah. And Judd was very much aware. That aware of it. Again, it's like, it's not yeah. really Judd's decision to do yeah. this. Yeah. But it's so hard to show that. You've got so much to cram into a film. Can can you actually then dedicate time to also even just budget, you know, makeup and design everything yeah. to showing a Wendigo? It's like the Wendigo acts through both. That's how, for example, Gage when he's all, all uh, dead and evil at one point shows shows himself to his mother in like a top hat in this particular guy because for some reason her Rachel's parents' house is full of creepy portraits, which is something that uh, Mary Lambert talked about. Said she put them up there because they always frightened her because. Most of the time, they had portraits done of the children after they died. Mm. And there was just something really creepy about it. So Gage, on, on, on purpose, is dressed to look like one of, the fo- one of the portraits in her parents' house. Yeah. And he seems to just know things. Ellie just seems to... Know things. Know things. It's very much the Wendigo. Yeah. For, one thing I don't really care for in 2019, actually, it's the introduction to the pet cemetery when you see a bunch of kids going to bury their pets and they're all wearing like animal masks. Mm. And it's so, I think it's so that they can have Ellie wearing a creepy mask in the finale. Mm. Don't really care for it. It's yeah, just, that's fair. Some, it's just a little bit. It doesn't of really like, have any relevance. At little all. like, vi- like extra visuals. That, eh, doesn't really add much to the yeah. story. So yeah. Zelda and Pascal. Oh, here we go. So <laughs> similarly here with we go. not wanting to kill Gage. They didn't really want to do the same thing with Zelda in 2019. I do like what they did, but they downplay they the effects against still oh. look really good. But they didn't just want to go the same that 89 did because it's iconic and it scared a lot of people. It, it's I look. I'm gonna tell you the truth. I don't think I'm sorry. I mentioned this at the beginning, but I I have I've seen 89 many times. I think you watched it for the first time with me. I've only seen I'd it twice. seen it a few times yeah. before that. I sort of like not introduced it to, you, but you know what I mean. I'd seen it many years ago. 
I watched it in broad daylight on a Sunday afternoon for the very first time. It was just on TV. And I thought, all right, I'll sit down and watch it. Fine. 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 Well, that's sad. Fine. Gets to Zelda. And I, to this day, Zelda scares me. And I am being genuinely serious. There is something about Hubert Sex... What's it, what's he called? Hub, Hubbard sex performance that is just so... They just did it so well, maybe a little bit too well. And the, the makeup with the spine and everything. Oh, yeah. It, it, Stephen Gage takes on... Well done. Looks like him at one... Her. Mm. Yeah. Looks looks like Zelda at one point. Yeah. To try and treat, like, scare. Yeah. Rachel. And when it came to 2019, the film... Obviously, Zelda is a, is a crucial part of the book. But they, when they came to writing the script for it, they were seriously debating whether they should even include Zelda because of how effective it was in 89. And they, they knew, they were like, we can't live up yeah. to that. They were seriously considering not including Zelda. Yeah, and I, I do like what they did in it. But also the Zelda scenes that were deleted, that's part one of the things that was deleted. And it's a really, really good scene with adult Rachel. Yeah. It should not have been cut from the film. Well, what I, d- what I did like, and I guess to them it was sort of like a compromise, because 2019 obviously does include Zelda. We do have an actress in the makeup and everything. But what they sort of said was, okay, well, 89 delivered on like the, the physical scares of Zelda. Like there was a lot of, you know, Zelda has dialogue in 89. Like we actually spend a little bit of time with her and the, the, the dialogue she has is very creepy and everything. So when it came to 2019 the way that they wanted to include Zelda was not to so much focus on the physicality of the character. And I don't think Zelda has any dialogue in 2019 either, but they wanted... Maybe the occasional word. Like maybe, like whisp- maybe like the occasional yeah. whisper or anything. But there's no dialogue between Rachel and Zelda. Um, but the way they, they did it instead by exploring Rachel's grief. And that was where more of the fear came from. Like the... And, and also the fear of Rachel as a child hearing her sister upstairs, hearing her crawling across the floor, dragging herself to the dumbwaiter, the fear of going up the stairs to actually have to confront her sister. And I I, I like that. I actually think that works really Zelda well. falling down the dumbwaiter is... That that was a good jump scare. That was one of the best scares, I think. In the, I, I was on... Te- you, could, you know where it's going. Like, you know yeah. what's going to happen. But the dumbwaiter... Even just the sound of, like, the, the word the dumbwaiter, it's kind of... I don't know. It's kind of eerie. And yeah, like you hear her dragging herself, dragging herself to the dumbwaiter and then there's just this horrible crash and then we see her down in the dumbwaiter. Uh, that I, I I think Zelda's done very well in both adaptations. Yeah. For different reasons. Pascal Nibard is, like I mentioned previously, has done significantly better in 89. Yeah. And I think it's just, again, they're not like, they don't lean on him too much. He kind of, he does the necessary thing. So he shows Lewis the Pet Cemetery in his dreams and, whatnot tries to act like a bit of a warning but it's just a nothing character in 2019 he shouldn't I, have been in it yeah so, i think like, they, they almost could have gotten gotten rid of him yeah it, they could have just had him die yeah and that would be it it's such a shame because he is such an important character and he's memorable in 89 mm. because he has a bit of a personality he is a bit funny like he travels on the fucking plane with mm. rachel back from chicago you know from chicago all the way to maine i don't know if that happens in the book a lot of, again, if we did it as a series, we could have a whole episode on when Lewis is digging up the child, Rachel traveling. Because again, she feels something that uh, I think Mary Amber mentions, and it is in the book, Ellie is psychic. Yes. And she knows that she she can see Pascal. Yeah. Um, something compels Rachel to go back. Yeah. And something keeps trying to stop her from getting back, whether or not it's like yeah. bad traffic, bad flights, crashing. Yeah. And it's like, Pascal is trying to help her get back. Yeah. The Wendigo is trying to stop her from getting back. Yeah. And I think I mentioned this in our uh, Salem's Lot video. She passes a sign for Jerusalem's Lot. Oh, yeah. yeah. There's little nods. And little things, nods, yeah. It? Well, his whole all his worlds are connected in some yeah, way, yeah, I, I think. think like, yeah, I think a lot of those may be pretty close to Castle Rock. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the one I'm reading at the minute is kind of unconfirmed to be linked, but uh, the girl who loved Tom Gordon, mm. it's not too far. And whatever it is that's after her could be the Wendigo. It, it, I don't think it's ever really been confirmed. Right. You're enjoying that as well. I am enjoying it. I'm really enjoying it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Pascal done way better in it in 89. Yeah. I think the actor just looked like he was having a He's even like... He's not on this. This is the 30th anniversary Blu-ray, which mm. I really have a lot of cool special features on. Even this, 90 minutes of special features. Oh, yeah. Fantastic. 
the main poster had Pascal on it. Yeah. I will say as well, both adaptations, the, the makeup of when he's initially brought into the hospital with his head injury. Great. Uh, both of them actually, like excel in that. It's it's done really, really, really well. But yeah, I mean, there's no comparison. It's like, it's, what's he called? Brad Greenquist from 89. Like, he is, he is, you know, he is Pascal. Like, to 2019, the character just may as well have not been there. I think he pops up every now and then, but it's like, he's barely memorable. Yeah. He doesn't have any interaction really with any of the other characters. And yeah, I, I understand why like they felt the need to, why well, we've got to include him. Talk about the ending. So obviously we have the, the showdown. Judd has to, Judd has to die. Uh, yeah, as is the way. Always gets stabbed in the, stabbed in the, uh, we in the sliced, uh, sliced. Achilles heel. Well, I feel like cause it's under the bed in the original one, like it is in the book. So he goes past the bed in 2019. Everyone's waiting for it, but it doesn't happen. It happens yeah. on the stairs. The ending of 89, they actually, filmed additional scenes for it because the book ends where Lewis is forced to kill his own son with a, mm-hmm. a like a syringe mm-hmm. that's how he kills the cat as well which cat, cat also wasn't there uh, wasn't hard yeah that great moment all the action the, the uh Miko never actually saw any violence whenever they could they swapped him out for a puppet yeah so I think he just thought he was like playing those cat, cat's elvis so now so he goes he was having a great time apparently, yeah he, apparently he loved it and it this is one bit where he's like got to act all delirious and he fell back and knocked and knocked his head. Apparently, that was just all just him. He just did that. He just did that. Well, it's like Danny Lloyd in The Shining. Um, he had no idea he was in a horror movie. He just thought he was doing like a family drama or, or something. It's like you know, like filmmakers, they will shelter you, even though we're talking like a different time. Filmmakers will will you know yeah. protect. So he was. I just love that. After it, Gage knows he's been defeated. He's like, no fair. No fair. No oh. fair. No fair. That syringe going into his neck. It looks neck, really good, doesn't it? it? That is horrible. Oh, when he, when he bites is... Judd's neck. Yeah. Apparently, he got told, like, oh, you guys go, I pretend to bite Judd, and then they very quickly cut to, like, Fred's reaction, then it's the yeah. dummy pulling his... Incredibly yeah. well done. Well, Gage also gives him, like, a Glasgow smile, doesn't he? Yeah. he slices him across the mouth, which is... Yeah. And, and Fred Gwynn is just, like, so shocked. It's... Yeah. I think what helps is you've got some really good filmmakers and a really talented director. Yes. And just good actors. Very like, good actors. Really, really good actors helping make this scene, yeah, make this scene totally, work. Totally, totally. 2019, obviously, obviously Rach, like in the book, Rachel goes straight to the ho- to Judd's house mm. and is is killed by a, by a child. And when you see her just hanging... Oh, yeah. God, Lewis is having a, Lewis is having a bad day. That is... Th- yes. So he... Yes. The book ends with... He sets the house on fire and his assistant from... Uh, hospital is sees him carrying him. Uh, is it dead weight they call it the barrier? The dead weight, uh, maybe, maybe. Yeah, I can't, I can't remember. Sees him carrying a body. Mm. He's taking Rachel he's to a, the cemetery. Yeah, this one they. That is how it ends. He's, he, he says, "Oh, I left." Pascal tries to stop him. He says, "Oh, I left it too long with Gage, but it'll work this time." He walks through the ghost of Pascal, which I, I also really liked, and then he sat, he sits in his kitchen playing solitaire and that was where the film originally ended but they did reshoots to have her actually mm. come back mm-hmm. i don't i think she does come back they had reshoots to show that uh, the bring the knife up oh yeah right. and the makeup on her incredible what? both of them act really well in that scene yeah but it's funny. very clear it's oh he he, he dies he's so fucked <laughs> the ending of 2019 uh rachel goes to the house and sees ellie yes and she that is hor- that is horrifying. And she tries to hug her. Ellie's like, "Hello, Later. mommy." <laughs> or something, you know, something along those yeah, lines. Trying to be endearing. She's being great. So it's the same way. Judd has to, Judd has to die. Yeah. Uh, Rachel, Rachel has to die. Rachel dies, and in this one, Ellie buries Rachel, doesn't she? Yeah, Ellie drags her. Ellie drags her. Basically, it ends up with the whole like Gage is Lewis put Gage in the car, and all three of them end up dead and walking. Walking towards him, it ends with him looking down. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That the alternate ending. That's where I'm, I'm at. I'm angry that they didn't go with this ending. Yeah, yeah. And it, it shows again the manip- the manipulation because Rachel says so after because the, they end the fight in the pet cemetery in this one. Yeah, and in well, and in the original one. And Rachel says to him when she's been sat, "Do not bury me in that place. Please don't bury me. Please there. don't bury me yeah. in that place." And it is. Ellie that convinces him to do it mm. and he doesn't die and he, bur- he buries her he gets Gage and the film ends he sat in a chair holding Gage 
the two of them walk in, his dead wife mm. and his dead daughter, either side of them, hand on each shoulder, mm. and the camera pulls out out the window. So it's framing them like some really messed up family portrait and it just Put, keeps just pulls. pulling out. Yeah. And the look mean? on Jason's face yeah. when he's doing that. It's incredible. It's so much, it's a much, for me, a much darker ending than, oh, they all just die. Yeah. It's, it. this makes you think, what would, ha- what happens What's next? What's going to happen? And I'm annoyed. Yeah. That I can't watch. There's one thing I like about our recent Halloween Blu-rays that with the alternate ending, you can watch the film with the additional scenes and the original ending on it. Yeah. I wish I had that option on this Blu-ray. I know. That ending is so much better. It was. It, was it wouldn't necessarily good. make it a better film than the original one. Mm-hmm. But it would be getting closer. Yeah, it it was infinitely more effective. Mm. And yeah, it's like, well, what are they going to do with him? It's like, do they intend to kill him too? Or do they need to keep... Do, do they need him alive well, so he can when... shelter them and look after and them? And feed off them suffering yeah well this is okay so this is also an interesting thing that having now seen pretty much every iteration of pet cemetery across the board there is there are glaring inconsistencies with how the dead act when they come back and i do think between 89 and 2019 there's probably more similarity than there is with any other sequel or you know prequel here on in but there are still differences because again, like eighty nine, the flashback with Timmy Bateman, um, he's like zombie. He's a, he's a zombie. He's thing. a zombie. Yeah, he's like he's in, inarticulate, uh, which is from what I understand, it's different from how it is in the book. And then twenty nineteen, we've got Ellie who comes back, who is very articulate, and yeah, she's kind of like quietly creepy, but she's not a zombie. They're not and necessarily. She have. doesn't act dead. Yeah. It's one of my other little ones when they're trapped more like zombies. Said. They're not. It's more complicated. Than it's that. more complicated. But 2019 does introduce this idea of the dead wanting to bury more, more people. people, which isn't in the book. It's more like the Wendigo wants the living to bury the dead. Yes. It wants them to commit the act. Yeah. Whereas this, well, the, the alternate ending anyway with 2019 is. Ellie wants Ellie kills the mum, buries the mum. Wants wants Lewis to bury. Well, so wants Lewis, wants to, do Lewis it. to do it. Yeah, so it's like almost like this weird <laughs> recruitment yeah, of more dead people. Yeah. The original ending, she does bury Rachel, and then Rachel kills Lewis. Yeah, and presumably buries him. And presumably buries him. I prefer the original one where that that last bit of manipulation, probably because they're so close to the burial ground at this point, the wedding has more more effect convincing him that burying Rachel is the best thing to do in that yeah. moment. That is a, it's so much darker yeah. and more interesting. I actually think it's more creepier if you don't have the dead wanting to bury other yeah. people. I actually, there's some, I think if you just contain it to, no, it's the living that want to bury people so they can have them come back and then you are just stuck in this god-awful situation where you are living with a dead person who is inherently different. That to me is more creepy than, you know, like, dead people recruiting an army of more dead people yeah. <laughs> i don't yeah you get what i mean i, I get i get what that. you mean yeah yeah so that that that, that is an interesting difference um but yeah otherwise overall i really like 2019 yeah, i mean the ending that's what bothers bit... me is there is a better version of this film on the blu-ray yeah than the, than what they put out i still have like issues with it but i do actually do think it's quite a good film yeah 89 is just it's just a bit. It's just better for me. Another another gripe I have with twenty nineteen is, and this was a bit of a glaring one for me. It's when Lewis goes to dig up Ellie from the grave. So Rachel's back in with her parents at this point. He's alone. He goes to bury. Uh, sorry, dig up Ellie. When he digs her up, she's very much intact. Yeah. In that grave, and I know this is going to sound really morbid. The, the fact that I'm basically saying, like, I wanted a decaying-looking child. I wanted to see that. But I just, like... All right, she's been embalmed. But she would not be looking like that. Yeah. <laughs> and in t- 1989, we don't see Gage because he digs him up and then there's just... It cuts to a scene where he's holding him and his yeah. Gage's face is obscured. But what I did come to find out is in the book, it is very graphic. 
and it is very explicit. There's almost moss growing on him. And Lewis, for a horrible moment, thinks that his little boy's head is gone. He thinks that the head has yeah. just disappeared. And then he realises, oh yeah, it's just moss and it's decay. And he has to like um, fling it off him. Um, and I just think in 2019, we could have gone a bit harder with that. Yeah. today If we were to make it today, as the series that we keep pitching, you could do all of you this. You could. Yeah, you and could. Do you have any more notes on these? So I've reached the end of my notes. I, I feel like I did have more notes, but maybe maybe I don't. Just again, just to reiterate my, lo- my love of the sound design in 2019. I, you know, I've talked about the lack of it in the collision. Zelda's crawling was very, very effectively creepy. There's a brilliant sort of jump scare at the very beginning where we hear the lorry zooming past in the truck. Something 89 does better is the trucks are a presence. Constant presence. Constant presence. Like, we are reminded yeah. constantly, like, there's there's a truck. <laughs> there are yeah. trucks going along this road. Like, look out for the trucks. That's kind of missing in 2019. Um, Overall, I do think these are two really, really solid adaptations of what is, you know, a, a, a difficult book mm. to, to adapt, as is most Stephen King novels, because there is just so much. You yeah. have to pick and choose. But I think they both deliver... On the sadness and the trauma yeah, of sudden death, like it, I can relate to, to Lewis in in certain ways, um, and I think eighty nine it has that edge. But I also I think it was Joe Blow we were watching, um, who said like it's almost a shame that we, our first like big pet cemetery adaptation was made in the eighties because it felt like the eighties couldn't really do it justice because yeah. it's the eighties. <laughs> But then having said that, flash forward to 2019 and a lot of people still don't consider 2019 to be like a perfect adaptation either. No. So, um, I mean, 89 is plagued by like a lot of distracting 80s things. I mean, Rachel Short's, fuck me. <laughs> no, I can't. And Dale's <clears throat> acting is is really bad. Um, But 89, I think, maybe not more rewatchable because I don't think it is a very rewatchable story. But no. I think it's probably done a little bit more. Yeah. What that we I completely forgot to mention the banging soundtrack of the original one, which is probably what helps oh. push up for me. Mary Lambert, it she she made music videos. But very prolific music video yeah. director. Worked and, with some solid stars. Oh yeah. yeah. And she was friends with the Ramones. She was. She did a so few videos. There's two probably. songs credit there. Is. I can't remember the first one, the one that's playing on the, the radio of the drug that kills. Gage. Can't remember what's but they wrote a song for the film called Pet Cemetery. They did? It's like the, the third most played song when you go on Spotify. So yeah, they, she it's just a asked tune. Them, I don't want to be, be buried, buried in a pet <laughs> cemetery. cemetery. I lo- it, it, was, it made it into my top 100 Spotify. It's, it's I such a good song. I love that like... song. And I think that really helps give this song an identity. It really and does. And I miss it. I, weirdly, I was thinking about it when I was editing the Once Bitten video. Yeah. I miss it when films had songs made for them. Yeah. Like, I was, I was once been... I, lo- <laughs> like, I love stuff like that. Yeah. And I wish we got it a little bit more yeah. today. I don't know if that's just something that we've lost. Not obviously, th- soundtracks so. are made for films. Yeah, we don't but, have themes. Theme but particularly tunes. having a song about Pet Sam, I don't want to live my life again. Okay. You know, like, I, I love the music video for it as well. I, I miss that. Yeah. I really do. Yeah. And I think that's, what, again, what helps make this film a bit timeless for me. Yeah. Oh, it dates it specifically when it came out, but the story itself is timeless. Yeah. The film is a bit timeless. Like. Yeah, totally. And I think it's what's going to pull me back to watching this one more than this one. They also, I, they took a lot of care and attention on the on they, the rescan for the Blu-ray. They did. They actually called Mary Lambert back in, didn't they, to oversee it? They did. Yeah, they did. I don't know Stephen King's thoughts on 2019. I tried to find them and I couldn't. Um, but he must have had some involvement if but, he gave the okay yeah, yeah. for the for the switch. So I was I'd, I'd like to think he liked it. As I say, I think it is a decent adaptation. Um, I was just going to pull up a point, and now I've I've totally lost it. Oh yeah, just going back to Zelda again. Um, I just a, quick, a few quick highlights of you know never get out of bed again. One of the creepiest things I've ever seen in in film. But also the character has spinal meningitis, and uh, that's something that is mentioned in the book. Now, I was Googling this, and a lot of people have opinions on this. Spinal meningitis... Doesn't do that. Doesn't quite look like that. Yeah. (laughs) So I think that was basically just Stephen King, you know... 
using a very general term Even to apply it. I to... imagine that it would have been age range, maybe like maybe like the sixties. Yeah, 50s, 60s. I guess. I guess. Also, like, isn't Zelda meant to be like a thirteen-year-old girl? Yeah. And Andrew Hubertsek is absolutely not. not <laughs> He's like a twenty-year-old man. It's, <laughs> it's, the, same it was, man. it's the same in twenty nineteen. <laughs> that is not a thirteen-year-old girl. No, fuck it. It's also not. someone else that could be clue in the series is Rachel and Lewis's relationship with their parents because their parent Lewis hates Rachel's parents because for making hate- her look after Rachel the night, and obviously ended up being the night that Zelda yes. died. Yes. Uh, we could include a bit again. There's just no time in a film. No. Make it a series. It doesn't have to be multiple... Even a miniseries, like six episodes, I think could be enough to do this. Yeah, totally. Six I agree. hour-long episodes. I agree. Come on, Netflix. You've done Stephen King adaptations. Let, let's do this. Pets, it, it would work. It would absolutely work. Six six episodes, you could do this book to- completely justice. Yeah. I'm going to end it there. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, we like both of these. Which one is your favourite? Let us, let us yeah, I'm sure people are going to have strong opinions. I'm sure. Honestly, I was one of those people. I had strong opinions of disliking 2019 until I gave it another shot. And I never struggled to find the Blu-ray for it. I always no. saw it in HMV. I so really I'm like, liked right, it. well, there's got to be a demand for it. And I think once I like sat down, I was all right, I'm just going to take it in as if it's my first time watching this. I'm like, okay, I, I will admit, I, I think I was wrong about this film. I agree. Even I... if it does still have issues. Yeah. Uh, I thought so, it was good. Next week, we are looking at the sequel to Pet Cemetery, also directed by Mary Lambert, but one that Stephen King had his name taken off of, <laughs> Pet Cemetery 2. We are, you know, we are looking at that, yep. Following that, we will, like I mentioned, we'll be doing Pet Cemetery Bloodlines, which came out last year, which is a prequel to this one. Yeah. To the 2019 one. Yeah, we're doing so, all the Pet Cemeteries, baby. All of them. So, thanks for something, guys. We love, I always get excited when it's our Steve, Stephen King project comes around. That fell off, like, all right, in Leprechaun, my diffuse is going to fall off the light. We recorded that one before this, and it's just done it again, so I'm going to tape that down. Again, it makes me look like I'm going to have a really good idea. Because, you know, there's a light bulb going off, but no, I'm, I'm not. Uh, I don't even know if you can tell. Like, anyway, thanks a lot, guys, and we will see you next week for the continuation of this project. Bye. <laughs>